Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kishore Mavubani. I'm the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this lecture. I can tell you, by the way, that normally this is not term time. This is uh, vacation in the school. Most of our students are away. <coughs> Friday evening, 5.15 15, 15 p.m., nobody comes for lectures. <laughs> so this full house is actually a, quite a telling sign that the topic you pick, obviously, uh, is of great interest uh, to everybody. So I think, as you also, I think as some of you may know, so when I speak at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, I try to make just three points uh, in my introduction. And the first, I guess, the most obvious point to make is that it is quite amazing to watch the level of uncertainty in Europe. I mean, even four years ago, five years ago, if someone had told you that we'd be watching Europe perch perilously, perilously close to a cliff, where we don't know what's going to happen to the Euro, you know, we were discussing what are the chances of Greece leaving the Euro, and now it used to be 10%, now it's up to 50%, some people say. We don't know. And it's amazing that a continent that used to be the most stable and the most predictable continent for the last few decades has now become one of the most unpredictable. So this is why, frankly, your topic is so timely uh, at this point in time. But the second point I'm going to make, of course, is that the challenges that Europe uh, is facing now are challenges that affect not just Europe, but frankly, all of us, right? I'm sure you're all talking to your private bankers. <laughs> How much should I keep in euros? <laughs> should I ditch all my euros? How will it affect the Singapore economy? How will it affect the COE prices? I'm actually hoping the COE prices will go down. <laughs> COE, for those of you not Singaporean, is a certificate of entitlement you need. You, before you can buy a car in Singapore, you have to get a piece of paper that allows you to buy a car. And that piece of paper now costs you $90,000. So I'm hoping the European crisis will bring COE price, prices down to maybe $50,000, $60,000. But anyway, that's partly a joke, but partly a serious point that what happens in Europe has got global ramifications and is affecting all of us. And that's why we now have to pay very close attention. So this, of course, brings me to my third and most important point is that we are very privileged to have with us someone who's obviously looked at carefully the situation. And you can see from his book on sale down there, the decline and fall of Europe. He clearly, he anticipated some of these developments. <laughs> uh, this book was published by Palgrave Macmillan and praised by the Wall Street Journal as the most perceptive account to date and by The Guardian as a wake-up call for the 21st century. But I was going to mention that our speaker has had a very interesting background. He comes from Italy, but now lives in Monaco. He has an MBA from Harvard and a PhD in engineering from Italy. And um, he's also worked and lived in China, Hong Kong, and other parts of Asia uh, for 15 years, and has also spent 18 years in the Arab world. So he knows the world. Uh, very well. He was formerly an investment banker and founder of the Monaco-based investment firm that includes in his portfolio direct investments in emerging markets. In Monaco, he's also president of the Monaco Asia Society, a non-profit organization chaired by His Royal Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco. Uh, he was also made a knight of the Order of St. Charles, which is an order established in Monaco in 1858. So we have a truly distinguished speaker he will speak to us for about 20 to 30 minutes, and after that, the floor will be open, and I'm sure you'll be facing many challenging questions. So, over to you, please. Distinguished guests and friends, Dean Kishore, good evening. The difficulty one faces in commenting Europe's current situation is that whatever is said tonight will likely be obsolete by tomorrow, as things will have gotten even worse. The general feeling of doom pervading most of Europe and the great concern felt by governments, companies, and people around the world are only matched by the realization that nobody 
least of all European leaders, know where it is all going to end or what the solutions are. At stake is not just the economic well-being of Europe, but also its political stability. For most of 2,000 years, the continent has been the scene of wars and conflicts involving city-states, empires, principalities, and nations. It is only for the past 70 years, as a result of the drive for political and economic integration between countries launched after World War II, that the continent has known peace and prosperity. So, if you ask yourself, what is the default setting for Europe, you won't have difficulty concluding that unless these countries continue to stick together, they may end up fighting each other. This scenario may be extreme, but don't forget that just before World War I, economies and societies were open, and France's largest trading partner was Germany. This is why the scariest element today is the sudden political fragmentation that would follow a Eurozone blowout. On the economic side, we only need to remind ourselves that the EU is, after all, the world's largest economic bloc, and that its slowdown is already hurting the American and Chinese economies, and that the demise of the European banking system would reverberate around the world like a tsunami. The noble aim of Project Europe was to entangle the destinies of European countries, in particular France and Germany, to such an extent that future wars among them would be unthinkable. On the other hand, the model at work inside individual countries, which with its high social costs, high taxes and labor rigidities, worked for a couple of decades after World War II at a time when growth rates exceeded 5%. After the oil shocks of the early 70s, growth rates nosedived. Yet the welfare state had by then morphed into what I like to call the civilization of entitlements. And social benefits kept piling up as if growth had continued. The model became unsustainable, except that Europeans continued to live beyond their means and simply stick the bills to future generations. Speaking about future generations, we tend to overlook the issue of demographics. It is a bomb exploding in slow motion due to very low fertility rates across the continent, or most of it. Let me give you a couple of shocking statistics. By the end of the century, the entire population of Italy is projected to dwindle to a mere 10 million people roughly a third of the population of Shanghai. Germany's workforce of 44 million people today is due to shrink to 26 million within a few decades. You can imagine the impact of this shrinkage on these countries' GDPs. At the same time, the proportion of Europe's dwindling population that is old and retires is growing. They live longer and less and less working people will sustain them with their taxes. So, unless everybody re rediscovers right away the joys of making babies, or taxes are drastically increased, or welfare drastically reduced, or immigration massively increased, the system will soon collapse. Many European states, given the extent of their unfunded liabilities, are in fact virtually bankrupt today. This is why governments have no choice but to fund tax money wherever they can. Their tolerance for private wealth and fiscal niches will disappear in the years to come. Some governments live in the fantasy that by taxing the rich, they will solve their problems. France's new president, François Hollande, is hiking income taxes for high bracket earners to 75%, a move that prompted Britain's David Cameron to say that if Paris doesn't want its rich people anymore, they're welcome in London. <laughs> How high can taxes go before you see social disruption and a collapse of business enterprise in some countries? Take again the example of Italy, where it can be said with candor that the social contract was based on the premise that the state would steal from the people and the people would steal from the state. <laughs> Nowadays, government coffers are empty and the state is basically saying, 
we can keep stealing from you, but you can't steal from us anymore. <laughs> in the past few months, bombs have started exploding, and more than 80 entrepreneurs have committed suicide. In Greece, by the way, close to 2,000 people have committed suicide, and in Spain, the numbers are raising. The one element that could improve things is, of course, economic growth. Suddenly in Europe, everybody is rediscovering growth, even Mr. Hollande. But do they know what they're talking about? The absurd rigidity of labor markets, over-taxation, over-regulation, and a broken banking system make the task nearly impossible. If the business of Asia is growth, the business of Europe is welfare. For the past several decades, governments across many parts of Europe, particularly in the South, have done an excellent job eradicating growth from their DNAs. In a globalized world, you can grow if you're not competitive. And you can be competitive if you cling to the shortest working weeks and the longest vacation time in the planet and slash R&D. The lessons don't seem to sink in as a recent ruling of the European Court of Justice says that if an employee falls sick during his vacation, he's entitled to another paid vacation. <laughs> France, where 15-year-old kids were sent to the barricades to protest an increase in retirement age, and where it often pays more to stay home and live on government handouts rather than work, has not really been growing for the past 30 years, and its share of world export has fallen by, by 20% in the past seven years. How do you expect Italy to grow when the backbone of its economy is made of small and medium-sized enterprises, which have been persecuted by the system to the extent that many entrepreneurs are now afraid to take their Ferrari out of the garage for fear of the fiscal police? When faced with a downturn, Countries such as Italy used to devalue their currency to boost exports and restart their engines. Something they cannot do anymore because being in the Eurozone, they have no more control of their currencies. Brutal austerity measures have made things worse and governments are at a loss about how to reconcile the clashing imperatives of austerity with growth. If you show me a person who can blow air from his mouth and suck it in from his nose at the same time, I'll show you an economy that can go into austerity and growth at the same time. But, you'll say, Germany is growing at over 2% per year. Yes, and smart labor reforms started by Chancellor Schroeder a decade ago paid off, as in the last decade, German wages went slightly down in real terms, while those of Spain and Portugal went up 30%, and those of France up 19%. But the only sector that has been performing well in Germany is the Mittelstand, the universe of small and medium-sized enterprises, which restructured itself to become a formidable export machine focused on the BRICS. China became the factory of the world, and Germany became the factory of the factory of the world. But China is slowing down, and about 40% of German exports go to the Eurozone, which is also slowing down. The rest of the German economy, in particular its service sector, doesn't look particularly healthy. You may be surprised to learn that the World Bank ranked Germany as 102nd out of 181 countries in which to start a new business and that as recently as 2005, Germany's economy was one of the weakest in Europe, and that in 2008, it shrunk 4.7%, twice as bad as France's economy. At 0.4% per year, Germany's productivity growth is the second lowest in Europe, just ahead of that of Italy. Not entirely surprising, since during the decade and the 2008, Germany had the lowest investment rate of all OECD countries. So, Germany may be looking relatively good right now, but a sustained high performance of its economy is by no means a given. And when Germany slows down, 
Will there be a single German politician willing to risk his career by asking his voters to fund more Eurozone bailouts? The first thing Mr. Hollande did upon assuming power was to lower retirement age from 62 to 60 for many people at a time when Germany increased its own from 65 to 67. Why should Germany fund France's cozy lifestyle or the inefficiencies of Greece, of Greece and Italy? Germans don't want to end up in a transfer union in which they'll keep paying the bills, which is why they resist the mutualization of debt such as Eurobond and similar measures. Yet, Germany is stuck between a rock and a hard place because if the Eurozone breaks down, the dominoes could fall across the continent with unpredictable economic and political effects, putting at risk, among others, over one trillion euro worth of German exposure and could cost it up to 25% of its GDP. The Eurozone's central conundrum today is that without measures amounting to Germany subsidizing others, there cannot be a Eurozone much longer. But if it pays the bills, Germany will at least want to run the show, i.e. somehow control the budgets of weaker Eurozone num members, implying a loss of sovereignty and externally imposed additional austerity measures that others are not ready to accept. Since political leaders do not have a solution to this conundrum, nobody really knows how it will all end. One thing Germany has unfortunately been successful at is to insist that the Eurozone crisis is fiscal and force governments across Europe to enact brutal austerity measures all at the same time. First of all, this strategy made no sense for countries like Spain or Italy, who were basically at primary budget surplus before the crisis. As was the case with Ireland, the origins of Spain's problems were not public or fiscal, but private, due to a property bubble financed by banks. The austerity strategy has had disastrous results overall, plunging many economies into recession and slowing growth in others to an extent that shortfalls in tax receipts turn out to be larger than savings from budget cuts, with the perverse end result of worsening their debt situation. The best example of this austerity trap is England, as the Cameron government recently discovered. The supreme irony is that the euro, which was supposed to be the final glue holding Europe together, threatens instead to blow it apart. Abandoning the Deutsche Mark for the euro was the price French President François Mitterrand extracted from Germany to allow its reunification after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1988. The currency union was fundamentally a political construct dis designed to dilute Germany's newfound power and was launched despite serious misgivings from the Bundesbank and from Many Germans and many economists were warning that it couldn't work. How could there be a single currency and central bank with no central treasury and such disparate economies? Yet, it was launched in the hope that economies would miraculously converge, and there was, of course, no plan B in case they didn't. Moreover, Germany and France were the first to breach the Maastricht currency union rules in 2003, after which nobody took the rules seriously. Having joined the Eurozone, peripheral countries such as Spain or Greece gorged themselves on easy cash, courtesy the banks from surplus countries, and thought themselves rich. Instead of using the money, to invest in value-added industries, Ireland and Spain created property bubbles of gigantic proportions. Greece funded its pro profligacy. Foreign banks were happy lending to them, oblivious of individual countries' risks. The Eurozone crisis is, in other words, self-inflicted and was expected to happen. It hit earlier and more brutally than would have otherwise happened because it came in the wake of the American-induced subprime crisis that brought about a credit crisis which put European economies on their knees. 
a single European institution has so far prevented a meltdown, the European Central Bank. The ECB's mandate is restricted, dedicated to fighting inflation, a rule imposed by Germany. Unlike the American Fed, it is not empowered to intervene in the economy to spur growth or directly buy the debt of sovereigns, something that is now changing. In order to prevent a Eurozone collapse, the ECB had no choice but to overstep its mandate, buying several hundred billion euros of sovereign bonds of countries under attack from the markets and launching one trillion euro worth of backdoor quantitative easing measures to sustain a shaky bank system. system. Well, but what next? Interbank lending rates remain high, meaning banks don't trust each other, preferring to park excess cash with the ECB, even if it yields less. A lot of this ECB money was used by banks to buy sovereign bonds that have been losing value every day, while little of this cash went into the real economy that needed it. Banks have become over-dependent on the ECB, the system remains shaky, and even giants such as Deutsche Bank have been facing downgrade by Moody's. A proper restructuring of the banking system can only happen if hundreds of billions are found to recapitalize banks and a real banking union takes place. It would imply centralized control, which Germany favors, but also features such as the continent-wide deposit insurance scheme, which Germany doesn't want to hear about, because it would have to share the liabilities. In the absence of a proper restructuring of the banking system, the run on the banks and bonds of southern European countries has to some extent already started. That's what the mark is telling you when Germany borrows at close to zero, while Italy and Spain, the third and fourth largest economies, pay a premium of, of, of over 600 basis points. And it was reported that close to 100 billion euro fled Spanish bank banks in recent months, part of a flight of money from the periphery to safer German banks, a trend that creates dangerous imbalances. To what extent will the ECB continue to play the role of a firefighter? Recent moves to cut interest rates to their lowest levels ever mean the central bank has now exhausted all monetary options, and since credit flows to troubled countries continue to shrink, it will need to resort to more indirect and quantitative measures such as bond purchases to keep the system afloat, something Germany doesn't welcome. Since the ECB is not allowed to act as lender of last resort to troubled countries, the market keeps demanding higher and higher interest rates from them. When governments cannot borrow anymore from the market at affordable rates, they have to turn to bailout mechanism to survive, as Greece and others did. The original EFSF mechanism was cobbled together to save small countries such as Greece and Portugal, but it never had the firepower to tackle much larger realities such as Spain, let alone Italy. Even if it's its successor, the ESM lacks the firepower to credibly do so. In the absence of a credible firewall that would insulate larger countries from contagion, the Eurozone remains highly vulnerable to market attacks. Recent moves, such as those enabling the use of bailout funds to directly prop up weak banks or buy sovereign bonds, bring welcome flexibility and help break the vicious circle linking weak banks to weak governments. Yet, those moves are not made as part of a coherent master plan, but represent the usual, last-minute, unavoidable measures to prevent catastrophe. As usual, markets and the media at first react positively to the news, only to let their disappointment known a few days later when they realize how short on detail and iffy in implementation the whole construct is. Which is why Spanish and Italian bond yields climb back to close to 7% to the 7% unsustainability zone a few days ago. Think about how weak the euro construct was. Greece represents only 2.3% of eurozone GDP yet by itself 
it threatens to blow the entire eurozone apart. Despite the face value of Greek bonds having been slashed in half, Greek sovereign debts will still represent 161% of GDP next year. The only people in the world who seem to expect that this country will be able to repay its debt one day are delusional European leaders. <laughs> Political leaders have utterly failed in responding to the crisis. Their response has consistently been to do too little, too late in the hope of gaining time for a miracle to happen. The miracle didn't happen. The doomsday scenario of Greece leaving the euro remains a possibility, which means Portugal and Spain could follow, and why not then Italy? France lost its AAA status and could come under attack too. Nothing is entirely impossible anymore. If Greece and weak countries stay in, Germany will need to write checks forever, and it doesn't want to. If they leave, the consequences are unfathomable. From a purely financial standpoint, if Greece leaves, it may default on close to 300 billion euro of debt and the European banking system would take a very severe hit at the worst time. The euro could soar up by 30%, reflecting more the economy of Germany, which means bye-bye German export, bye-bye middle stand and jobs. The best way to visualize today's Europe is to use geology's tectonic plates analogy. You have on one side a southern plate made of the countries bordering the Mediterranean which clung to an outdated and unsustainable model. This plate is sinking. To the west, the small British plate, divided into London and the, and the rest of the UK, is drifting away intent of on turning London into the capital of the world, more interested in the renminbi than in the euro. A Germanic plate, including Germany and its satellite countries, disillusioned with Europe and looking east and north, is rising. France has a foot firmly planted on the southern plate and is losing the footing it had on the Germanic plate. To the north, the Scandinavian plate is an oddity, having managed to successfully apply the European model because of its great social discipline, focus on innovation, and high involvement of women in the economy. Even if a way is found to get the Eurozone out of its immediate predicament, the fate of Southern Europe in particular is sealed because it is not competitive anymore in today's globalized marketplace. These countries learn to contend themselves with mediocrity and have no more ambition. Their inefficiencies and rigidities doom them to decline and impoverishment, the only question being the steepness of the slope. Sustained brutal austerity measures, impoverishment, fear and insecurity may lead to social instability and the rise of extreme political parties. It happened not long ago. It can happen again. In theory, solutions exist, but Europeans can seem to work together when it matters most, leading to the fundamental question of how European is Europe today. The only reforms its citizens, in particular in the South, can stomach are marginal ones because they are too attached to the benefits of the civilization of entitlements. Don't get me wrong. Europe is not about to disappear into a hole tomorrow morning. Europe is rich. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, Forbes magazine counted that 70% of the world's rich people are in Europe. Europe accumulated wealth since the Industrial Revolution a few centuries ago. Today, Europe has trouble creating new wealth, but is still relatively wealthy. Bearing extreme events, its decline will take time. The current, current crisis doesn't mean Europe should be kept off the radar screens of foreign investors. To the contrary, in such times, opportunities abound. Assets, companies, and technologies can be bought relatively cheap. The gap between the return on equity of European companies and the price they're paying the, the price they're trading at has never been so wide. 
You just have to take a look at the recent uplift in London property prices to understand that there are European regions which will benefit from the plight of other, other regions and niches throughout the continent in which wealth will continue being created. It's just that one needs to invest more selectively and do serious due diligence homework. If one thinks of a crisis as a short period of hard times from which one inevitably comes out, this is not a crisis. It is a new era for Europe and Europeans and the rest of the world better adjust to this reality. Thank you very much. I, I must say that uh, for someone who's um, personally been very worried and somebody's quite critical of Europe's performance, I wouldn't have been as tough on Europe uh, as you have been. I'm glad you ended your remarks by saying Europe's not going to fall the hole tomorrow, that maybe we should still consider investing in, in Europe. So maybe my first question, which is a contrarian question, is can you give us any other good news about Europe? <laughs> <laughs> they would be very short. <laughs> tell, us, tell us something, sir. Well, at the end of the day, it is still the, the first economic bloc uh, in, the, in the planet. Uh, and uh, on the good news side, people are starting to really realize that something is wrong and that the politicians are not telling them the, the, the whole thru truth. Uh, and understanding what the problems are, laying the, re the cold reality uh, on the table and looking at it with, with cold eyes, is the first step towards uh, finding solutions. And I think that we're getting closer to a time where people now are going to ask uh, uh, for, for a really good look at the entire system. And that could be the start of, uh, of a bit of a turnaround in the, in the, in the minds of, uh, of the people. My name is Hans Goethe, I'm from uh, Fina Port, we're an independent asset manager, and of course we're interested in investments in Europe included, of course. Um, question is, uh, we have a common currency, and of course you highlighted the design flaws uh, that were there from the start. Do you think that the EU as an entity can survive if it breaks, uh, let's say if the currency breaks apart, if the countries go back to their individual currencies, which obviously is the end game, unless we have a political and a fiscal union, which seems unlikely. But do you think the EU as an entity can stay together even if uh, the, 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 some of the countries go again uh, to their own currencies? It would, be, it would be very unlikely uh, that we don't see a sort of breakdown of the, of the EU if the Eurozone falls apart. Uh, because the, the, the political fragmentation, the problems uh, in, in between countries, the political fragmentation that would follow would definitely have an impact on the, on the political union. Uh, the, the, the Project Europe was a gradualist program from the beginning. When Jean Monnet and others uh, started the Project Europe, they never... Uh, they never set, let's say, a target. The process is itself of entangling more and more the destinies of the countries of Europe was Project Europe itself. Uh, somebody has been said it's like a bicycle that would uh, fall down if you stop pedaling, basically. So the question was to keep on uh, pedaling. Uh, but the uh, breakdown of the Eurozone would definitely pit country against country and have a tremendous uh, impact on the viability of the EU as a political union. We have a young lady is asking a question. Yeah. Hi, um, this is Ines. I'm a student at Victoria Junior College. Now, basically, um, I've heard in the news about this proposal to, fund, to directly fund bailouts to stricken governments by the European Financial Stability Mechanism and the European Stability Mechanism, but this was rejected by the government of Finland as well as the Netherlands. And so what we see here is that the governments of you know, these different countries, they're very inefficient in solving these issues, and there's definitely a lack of political will. So in this context, do you think that a fiscal union is possible in, you know, maybe not in recent years, uh, maybe not in the next few years, but how about in the next few decades, in order to rally the governments together and to ensure that you know, a central supervising body is there? Yes. Uh, your, your comment is, is, is very well taken. Um, a, a fiscal union uh, is, I mean, like a banking union and so on, has 
a lot of uh, political problems in, in Europe for its uh, implementation. Uh, having a single currency without having a, a, a fiscal union where you have a central a form of central budget control um, is, is really uh, difficult because you have countries with such diverging economies uh, in different trajectories and, and with very different uh, uh, habits, let's say, of, of spending uh, their, their tax receipts, that unless you have a, a true fiscal union, you, you will always have difficulties maintaining a currency union. But on the other hand, having a fiscal union implies uh, a harmonization of a lot of, uh, a lot of things in Europe that individual countries still consider as sovereigns. Uh, they do not want their budgets to be dictated by Frankfurt. Uh, so the difficulty really is basically uh, the idea of having more Europe. It seems that to keep the Eurozone together, you need a fiscal and banking union. And to have a fiscal and banking union, you really, in theory at least, need more Europe, right? And the problem is that the individual countries are not politically ready to make that step, let's say. In my opinion, I mean, when China look, looks at Europe, it, it looks at it with, with different hats. Uh, first of all, it's its, uh, its largest, uh, basi basically its largest export market currently. Uh, second, the euro for China represented the possibility to diversify away from the US dollar. So a, a, a strong and stable euro uh, was in a sense uh, beneficial to China from this uh, diversification standpoint. Then from a geo geopolitical standpoint, for China, uh, Europe is a bit of a uh, moderator of American actions around the world. So a weaker Europe, let's say, can play less of a moderator role, right? So globally, I would say uh, uh, China has an interest in the, in the well-being uh, uh, of Europe. But i let you... No, no, I just, just quick note, I actually agree with you that if you give, if China had a preference, China would like to see a stronger Europe rather than a weaker Europe. But I think, you know, now that even China has changed, the capability of the Chinese government to bail out Europe will lead, uh, has been severely undermined by the new openness of Chinese society. The Chinese netizens will protest and say, why are you sending away our hard-earned Chinese money to Europe when they're much richer, much wealthier than us? So I think the capacity of China to help Europe will be limited, although they have been trying incidentally. And I think the best way in which China can help Europe, and this is what they have suggested, is actually encourage more Chinese investment in Europe. And as you said, there are many good still industries and factories that are still a good bargain in Europe. And I think that's the best way to, to strengthen Europe. Father Dubinsky, Ambassador of Poland. Uh, of course, the, the, thanks for this very provocative and interest, uh, interesting uh, presentation. Well, and I would like to have two brief questions. The first one, uh, let's imagine, let's uh, put aside uh, Eurozone. But I'm generally wondering, what is your, uh, what's your general opinion regarding the, Europe, the, the concept, the idea of European uh, Union as, uh, as an old body? This is uh, the first question. The second one is some sort of comment, because I was really, frankly speaking, surprised uh, that you've mentioned no single word regarding uh, the so-called new European Union members. Of course, uh, sometimes, especially uh, nowadays, uh, the new members, newcomers to the European Union, uh, they are example uh, of very prosperous and uh, some sort of a success in the e uh, economy. That is why I'm wondering if it's just by chance it was uh, uh, not mentioned in your speech, or maybe you, you are going to present another speech regarding the successful newcomers to the European Union. <laughs> Touché. <laughs> um, well, on the, on the first question, first of all, uh, I think the, the, the political, let's say, union and political integration of Europe, as we said before, is indispensable because, because the countries in the continent have been fighting each other all the time. Uh, 
and uh, a disintegration of this, uh, this political union uh, could lead to any scenario, basically. If it's not within 10 years, it's within 20 or 30 years. So I think everybody in Europe is going to, to be working very, very hard to keep the political union, uh, but there are centrifugal forces, very strong forces uh, that, that are splitting, uh, splitting that apart. And if the, the Eurozone blows, uh, blows up, then uh, uh, it, it, all the bets are off. Uh, about uh, Central Europe, you're perfectly right. Uh, Poland, in fact, has been the fastest growing economy in, the, in, uh, in Europe uh, for, uh, for a bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Uh, they have, uh, you know, what happened is that after the uh, 10 countries from, from uh, uh, Eastern Europe joined the, the, the EU years ago, it was very interesting because they pushed extremely hard to get in. Right, and the, the the day after the day they get in, everybody in the, it was in Dublin the uh, the acceptance, and everybody was dancing in the streets. Right, and then after uh, a few months after that, there were some votes uh, that had to be done in Europe, and they were nowhere to be seen voting for that. Why? Because they focused really their attention on rebuilding their countries. They didn't want to espouse right away, at least, the uh, system of the civilization of entitlements. They were more looking at, at a bit of a more Anglo-Saxon model in the sense of more free enterprise, less government intervention. And it paid off. The, 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 I mean, these countries are, are doing quite well at the present time. The question is, how long before, how long until they can't resist the siren song of the uh, civilization of entitlements? How long people start, how long before people in those countries start to want the same sort of benefits and welfare and so on as the rest of Europe? By the way, if anybody wants to challenge uh, uh, Francesco's thesis, I hope you will do so. I mean, we should allow a contrarian, another contrary point of view. If anybody wants to say, no, Europe is going to rise tomorrow and grow very fast and everything will be fine, please say so now. <laughs> after, the after tomorrow, okay. Okay, uh, maybe the ambassador of the European Union, you can, okay, you can just press the microphone if you don't mind. Yeah. See that you are challenging. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think uh, I, there, was, there are a few points. Uh, uh, I wanted to make. I think, first of all, I agree that, that the European Union is, is not in a good shape for the moment, uh, even if it's still the, the, the first, uh, I think, the first economic power and first trading bloc. And, and I think also uh, there are a few uh, points, uh, what, what I think gives, gives a lot of hope that Europe is now on the right way. I think, uh, first of all, uh, I think this is the point that uh, uh, Mr. Bon Giovanni made, is that the people get more and more conscious that there is a problem. The people getting conscious that uh, uh, they cannot uh, go on maybe as it has gone on like that. And so it gets easier, I think, to make reforms. But this will not happen from one day to the other. It will take time. Uh, but I think there have been steps taken until now uh, the steps are seen by the markets, unfortunately, as too slow and only uh, never enough. We, we never take a decisive step. That's the perception we have. But I think step by step, we, we're going definitely in, in the right direction. I think the last European Council with the decisions we were uh, taken, also what you mentioned, to, to make, uh, to, to, well, how to say, it, to cut the link between the banking crisis and the sovereign bonds. Uh, by allowing the ESM to, to finance directly uh, uh, the, the, the banks. Uh, I think that's a very important step. It was a very, very difficult step, and it has now to be implemented. But you pointed out, the implementation will take again a few months, and markets seem then again to be disappointed that it takes a, few, a little bit time to do. But what I think the important thing is that politicians and so get more and more conscious and uh, that they will uh, accept also more. And there I, I disagree, uh, I, I would think, with you. I think the crisis uh, puts us in the way that uh, countries, people, are more and more ready to give up some sovereignty because they just feel that you need to give up sovereignty to come out of the crisis. I think that's also what you say. So I disagree with you that you think that you're saying that the countries are not at all ready. I think 
they are more and more ready and it will more and more come. They also are very much conscious, and that even if I not completely agree with you that the split up of the Eurozone would uh, uh, lead to a completely breakup of the European Union, a breakup of the, Euro, uh, of the Eurozone would be at least uh, financially and economically a, a catastrophe, and everybody is uh, aware of this. And therefore, I think that at the last moment, uh, everybody will stick together to save the Eurozone and save the European Union. Nobody will take the risk, but you describe the risk that uh, the European Union could uh, dis disintegrate and we could come to, to situations where there, there would be, again, a political conflicts and so on. The other positive element, what I'm seeing, is that a good functioning European Union is important for, for, for the whole world, also for the region here and that the region here has not yet su succeeded in, uh, in getting its own in going up the in, in having so much consumption that they could uh, live on their domestic or their regional markets. The uh, European Union remains an actor. So that's a uh, element where, which uh, makes me much more uh, optimistic, but I am not saying that the, uh, the crisis will be uh, solved tomorrow. We will go on to go to difficult times, uh, but steps I'm convinced will be taken because we are aware that we have to take them to not jeopardize the whole project. Thank, thank you, thank you. You want to respond or leave it as comment? Okay. Okay, we will get we'll get uh, another voice, uh, a strong Canadian voice now. Canada is going to save Europe, I'm sure. Thanks. Yeah, Canada wishes, still wishes to be part of Europe. <laughs> we still think there's an opening. <laughs> I'm uh, Irvin's student. Thanks, uh, Kishore. Uh, thanks, Professor Bongi and Mani, for a very interesting talk. I'm, vis I'm a visiting senior fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy from the University of Toronto. Uh, it strikes me, Professor Bongi and Mani, that there are three scenarios that are possible for you. For you. The best case scenario, if I'm not mistaken, is the current one. We're just muddling through like every federation or quasi-federation, and maybe it will get a little bit better, but there's no magical thing. The worst case scenario, and I don't see that happening, and perhaps I disagree with you there, is a total collapse both of the Eurozone and of the European Union. That is, the European uh, concept or, or, or idea becomes inchoate, and every country goes their, 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 uh, upon their own logic, and Germany is let loose, which was the original idea against which uh, Europe was born. The middle scenario, and perhaps I disagree with you there, is, is what the Polish ambassador suggested, if I misunderstand him, which is that Europe as a concept still exists. The Eurozone may collapse, but then again, it represents only 17 of 27 countries. The European idea as, as a construct still is attractive. It attracts Canada, not least, but obviously all the major players, and Europe and Germany is still reined in. So there is an economic catastrophe, but in historical terms, Europe regroups and it becomes still geopolitically cohesive. Germany is part of it, Germany is a leader, uh, but the project still goes. Do you agree with that? That's the first question. And the second one is, on the best case scenario, what's to be done if you were king of Europe? <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I didn't expect a no. question like this. <laughs> what's, what's the policy prescription on the, on the best case scenario to make things a little bit better? Can you rephrase the first question, please? The no, his, his first question was that, you know, that there are three scenarios, best case, muddling right. through, worst case, collapse of Eurozone, in EU. The middle case, the EU will survive even if Eurozone collapses. Right. And so do you see that as a, as a possibility? The, you see, the issue here is that there is a big assumption is that, is, if that the, the economic consequences of a breakdown of the Eurozone uh, wouldn't affect so much the, 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 the political cohesiveness. And this is really a big question mark. I would tend to say that it would tremendously affect uh, See, just, the, the political... I want to just add one point, uh, which is that, uh, and I think the Polish ambassador will speak to this, there are only 17 Eurozone members of 27, and Europe still continues to attract many would-be members from Turkey to Ukraine, again to Canada. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily in that in that order. <laughs> and the question is, does that gravity, that political gravity, not still exist, even though there's a temporary disintegration? Uh, again, there may be a question of leadership and the new culture of leaders that are able to reassemble the Jean Monnet and, uh, and, and, and successors to reassemble Europe, not as a tight 
economic construct, but at least as a political, geopolitical, uh, logical frame. This has been a, a bit of the British uh, view. I mean, they were long on creating, on, on looking at Europe. I mean, there are different concepts of Europe and what Europe should be. Uh, on one side, you have a very, uh, you had a very dirigist uh, concept, let's say, coming from France, because they see uh, um, Europe as something that should be more. I mean, it comes from the historical roots, let's say, of, of the of the way of governing in France. Uh, in the in the case of uh, of England and the most Nordic countries, they saw they saw uh, Europe more as a free trade zone. Uh, free flow of, of goods and people, and that's good enough. Let's not try to uh, let's not try to do more because we're going to face uh, uh, real challenges. So these these are some of the options that have been uh, on the table for uh, for quite a long time. The problem is that there is no clean way to go back to multi a multi currency Europe. You see, now that, that everybody is in the, I mean, not everybody, now that you have 17 countries in the, in the Eurozone with the largest economies also. Uh, so it, it's only uh, 17, but, but they represent the, the, the central force. And uh, uh, if, uh, if you have a, uh, a collapse, if you're trying to pedal back to saying, okay, we erase everything that happened uh, for the last uh, 10, 12 years and we go back to the way we were, uh, before, I, I don't see it as, uh, as, uh, as feasible without a, a terrible breakdown of the po political cohesiveness, that's it. And by the way, we'd be delighted to have Canada in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't answer this question. What, if you were king of Europe, what would you do? <laughs> he, his answer Look. is marry an Asian princess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second the motion. <laughs> no. Look, there, there, there are, we, we have to extract the problem of the euro and the eurozone and the debt crisis from what I think is the more fundamental problem in Europe itself, which is what I call the civilization of entitlements. Look, we, we, we had companies in, in Europe where uh, some very good employee would come to me and say, look, can you please fire me, boss? I say, why? You, you're good. You're doing very well. I say, no, because if you fire me, the government will pay 70% of my salary for two years. So I'll take a two-year vacation, and three months before the end, I'll start to look for a new job. <laughs> you know, you have a lot of things like this that are costing a tremendous amount of money. And the problem is that people in, in a lot of countries in Europe, especially in the South, where you have less social responsibility, let, let's say, of the population, they believe this is a birthright. So if you don't give this to, the, to them, they'll go out and burn cars in the streets. <laughs> You know, in, in 1968, when there were student, uh, very serious student demonstration across Europe, students demonstrated there because there was a future that was being designed and they felt they were not part of it. So they wanted to be part of this design of the future. Rec in recent years, when there have been young people demonstrating in Europe, it's just for fear. And they have become the conservative force in the country. They are afraid of reforms because what they aim at is to have one of these cozy jobs where you have a contract for life. You cannot be fired, basically. So to change a mindset like this, in my opinion, is an even bigger challenge than to solve the Eurozone crisis because that's in the minds of people. Next question. I must say I'm very surprised that not, there are not more challenges, you know, apart from the ambassador of the European Union here. Let's not make him do other. Anybody else wants to? Okay, please, please go ahead. The ambassador of the European Union again, please. Yeah. Just uh, about this, uh, I, I, I don't fully agree, but I, I think there are problems. But I think we have to say that the Nordic countries, uh, they had similar problems uh, 20 years ago, and they really succeeded in changing the mindset. I think. Uh, Nobody speaks anymore uh, about entitlement. They took measures, uh, if you control, if somebody is out of work, for example, you have to, to take up a new job, what you are offered, you can refuse one time in the first, I don't know, two or three months, I'm not now at the week, and then you have to take it up. If not, you lose all benefits. So there are measures and there are examples from countries who, who, who took this up, and I think the, the new, uh, uh, 
Euro Plus Pact and they, they were focused on com uh, competitivity uh, is, is, is at least trying to tackle these this problems. I'm agreeing this will not change in countries like Italy from today to tomorrow, but I think it will change because people are just getting more and more aware that uh, the way as it is now cannot go forward. But I don't also think that Europe wants to give up its model completely. We will, not, we will never give up our, our welfare state, but I think there's also a positive welfare state in the, in the, in the Nordic country. We will never give, uh, we will not take up uh, the Asian model. I, I don't think so that, that we, are, uh, we are ready to do this, and so as we should not impose our model here on our Asian plans. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't try. <laughs> no, what you're saying is true. I mean, there has been there have been some some moves in certain directions, but then there have been some uh, uh, some some backward moves in other directions. Look at France. Uh, now they're they're going to make it uh, uh, even tougher to fire people. There are laws that are being discussed by the new government to make it even tougher. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, now the, uh, the retirement age has been brought down from 62 to 60. So this goes radically against the, the trend of what should be done to cure this sort of problem. Uh, in Italy, for example, the reforms that, uh, that Mario Monti have been undertaking every time he is trying to change something substantial in this sort of labor rigidity laws, he hits a wall. And if he tries even more, he's going to have all the unions and half of the population in the streets. So yes, there are some moves in this direction, but I personally, and I wish I were totally wrong, but I think it's going to be very difficult to see a movement in the, in the proper direction in, uh, in, the, in Southern Europe. Can I, can I follow up a uh, question, uh, question? You know, when the European leaders, you know, I, I know Mario Monti quite well. In fact, he's spoken in our school, by the way, and he gave me a wonderful uh, foreword for the Italian edition of my book. So he's actually very well aware of what's happening in Asia. When the leaders meet in private among themselves, Angela Merkel or Mario Monti or David Cameron or uh, Holland now, do they... In private, are they aware that this problem is actually very serious, and that they have to work together in a, in a, in a sort of, in a, in a sort of no, 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 no. See, the, the impression you get from the media is that this can be fixed through short-term fixes, and it cannot be done. This needs a long-term change in direction. So the, my question is: when the leaders meet in private, do they acknowledge in private that this requires a deep long-term change in strategy and do they conspire with each other on how to tell the people that this is what you need to do? I've never been in one of these meetings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you seem to be well connected with some princes, maybe they can... <laughs> But uh, no, I think I think they're aware of the uh, of the of the situation. I, I don't think anybody uh, anybody thinks that. Uh, that. Mm. But you have also different systems of, of government. You know, in, in Germany, for example, it's a federalist system, and Angela Merkel is. You're not in a presidential system like France, where the president carries a lot of weight in making decisions. She has to arbitrate between a lot of political forces and the various lenders and regions and, and so on and so on. So she, she can agree to something with the uh, partners in the EU, but then you will have the constitutional court in Karlsruhe, or you will have the, the, the opposition parties or some lenders uh, shooting it down. Uh, so so the, the process, let's say, of, of, uh, of, of uh, finding solutions and, and taking steps is, is a, quite a complicated, uh, complicated one. Uh, I, I think they are really in a quandary, the, the European politicians, and what they have been, the way they have been responding uh, to the crisis has been to be always, they have been always behind the curve. Uh, it, it has been reactions to uh, a situation worsening, so how can we plug this hole or this hole? But there is no master plan on how to redo Europe, because nobody has any idea uh, uh, about that uh, at, the, at the present time. I, I haven't seen... Uh, 
uh, this being discussed as a master plan, let's say, to change the mentality, to change the workings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all incremental step, let's say, and, and maybe they could be enough, but, uh, but uh, you know, the, the idea is that uh, probably we, we need more of a long-term view and a master plan. Okay, Professor Huang Jing, the, uh, my colleague, yeah. Uh, Huang Jing and Jing Huang here at Yukon School. And just now some people ask about China's role in this entire problem. I'm going to ask what they think the Americans should do or what they are doing for all those things. What's your comments on Americans' policy or what you think their policy should be? We, are, we, they, are, they, are they celebrating in Washington, D.C. that you're about to collapse? <laughs> <laughs> I think President Obama is watching the situation very carefully because the impact on the American economy, let's say, could even cost him his election. Uh, there is an impact, but they have uh, limited means to, uh, to, to, to assist uh, Europe. They have their own problems, and they are not about to throw tons of money at another region of the world that, uh, that, that, that has problems. So I, I, I think we'll see little help, uh, uh, concrete help uh, in this way. They, you know, the, the, the uplift in the, in the economy in the U.S. is by no means certain, uh, and that's the first priority uh, for them. So on, the, on, the, on, the, on that side, I don't think much, much help is going to, uh, to be coming from the U.S. in concrete terms. Now, now what, what, what Jing is asking is that, will there be a new Marshall Plan? <laughs> <laughs> you mean Singapore has that much money to lend? <laughs> I think it would be, no, no, I think it would be difficult. But you see, one, one thing that could have done, I think, at the outset of the crisis was to build a very credible firewall. One of the problems of why the, the Eurozone crisis has evolved to the critical state in which it is today mm. is that there has never been a credible firewall so that contagion was almost automatically spreading from country to country. Now, at the outset of the crisis, when this was happening, maybe they could have gotten together and say, look, what we need is a two trillion euro firewall. And let's put in the, ES, the, the EFSF, uh, more funds from Europe. Let's ask maybe for a credit line from China. Let's put in the, the IMF. Let's bring something from the US. Let's tell the markets that they have no chance. As this, the alternative to the European Central Bank saying, we'll buy unlimited amount of bonds in the, in the market, right? But if you had a firewall like this from day one, uh, you probably wouldn't have a uh, the, the, the crisis spreading in such a critical way, and you would have had more time to think about medium to long-term solution instead of just fighting fire, uh, fires r uh, left and right. Uh, hi, I'm Sheldon from BJC. Uh, I'm a bit greedy, but I have three questions. Uh, first of all, um, given that the contagion effect you've spoken about has spread to the third and fourth largest economy in Europe, do you think even if we wanted to, we could save the European Union? Second of all, do you think that Britain has a bigger role to play in this project of saving the European Union? Because uh, all it's been doing recently has been like, making snide comments on France. So do you think there's a bigger role for Britain to play in saving the European Union? And lastly, there has been talk, uh, which was quickly drowned out, about establishing a two-speed Europe, that of having a core of the strong countries, of the Netherlands, Germany, etc. Uh, remaining in the Eurozone and the periphery dropping out. So essentially it would be like cutting off a gangrenous limb. Do you think this two-speed Europe would be an effective solution in solving this problem or do you think that the ramifications of it would be as bad as a complete fragmentation and disintegration of the European uh, Eurozone project? Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, a, a two-speed Europe meaning, uh, meaning uh, some countries leaving effectively the, the, the Eurozone uh, is one of the options that has been discussed, and it, it's, it's still not entirely out of the table because we don't know really if Greece is going to uh, to leave or not. So it could it could happen. You you don't but know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but who who knows? <laughs> I don't think there is anybody. <laughs> but. Uh, um, you see, the, the problem would be that it, the problem is that when countries start to to leave the, the eurozone, uh, uh, they have to repay their their debts in euros, and their income is going to be in drachma or lira or, or whatever. So the debt burden becomes extremely uh, high. 
Uh, most probably, if they leave the Eurozone, they would default on their debt, all of it, or most of it. So can you imagine the impact on, for example, German, French, English, British banks, and so on and so on? So the impact would be, would be tremendous. Uh, with an economic impact like this, there would be really a wedge driven politically, let's say, between the countries that are staying in and the, the countries that are uh, going out, because those, those that are staying in will have to pay a lot of bills, will be angry at the others, and, and vice versa. Right? Plus, uh, you know, currently you can say that the euro is overvalued for weaker countries, and the euro is undervalued for countries like Germany. So. Uh, for weaker countries, on the, on the restarting the engine, uh, let's say, uh, side, uh, this would be helpful. But for the countries that are surplus countries today, well, they would be in trouble because Germany, suddenly the euro would come very close to what a Deutsche Mark would be. And economists have been predicting that this could be a 20 to 30 percent uplift. And what this would do to, to exports uh, from, from Germany, which are driving the economy of, of Germany today, uh, would, be, would be quite uh, negative. Uh, on British role? On the, on the role of the UK, uh, the British, they, they, they would like to have their little island swim away from Europe as far as they can. <laughs> 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 <So>. <laughs> Today, today they're very happy that they didn't they didn't uh, join the, the euro, and uh, and uh, the, the the only role that they would like to play would be one of trying to convincing other to convince others that the euro, as, as uh, we we said before, should be more long, let's say, on the on the, the sort of trade uh, union, uh, trade uh, unification uh, uh, side, free market, mm. and and so on and much less on the political, much less for a fiscal union. They will certainly not want their budgets to be dictated by Frankfurt. Uh, so it's difficult to see a, a, an additional role for the UK. I think they're going in the other direction uh, right now. And then there was a first the question. The first question was about the, the contagion has spread to the number three, number four economies, Italy and Spain. So what do you do if it's got that bad? Well, the, the measure that was taken in the very short term now was to allow some of the uh, ESM funds to be directly uh, uh, injected in, uh, in banks, right? Why? Because uh, doing it this way, uh, uh, let's say you're, you're, you're talking about funds going directly uh, from the ESM to the banks rather than funds going from the ESM to the sovereigns first and adding to the debt burden. And if you add to the debt burden right now, you will have the, the interest, the, uh, the, the yields on the bonds going over 7%. It would then make that uh, the, the borrowing unsustainable, uh, as a consequence of which then uh, the, the, these countries would have to, to, to run to the ESM to ask for uh, much larger amounts of money because they couldn't finance uh, themselves anymore. It has been uh, uh, said that, uh, for example, in the case of Spain, if they were forced completely out of bond markets, they could require up to 500 billion in the, in the coming years, 500 billion euro in the coming years. So, so it's, it's good that there is this sort of move that, uh, that has been made. But let's remember that also the application is contingent on, on, on a banking union, as Germany uh, said. So for probably a year, uh, these these uh, these new loans will be on the balance sheet, let's say, of the of the country, right? Although it is expected that then there would be some form of a banking union and they would move out of that to go to the to the private sector. But still, it's a question mark. Yeah. Can I? Okay, please. Uh, one quick last question. Yes. My yes, name is Freddie from Sync Capital, a, a licensed financial advisory firm. Uh, I have the, uh, the privilege of working uh, from Sweden some years ago in the early 90s and working with 15 European countries in budget stress testing. And so I worked with the Northern European, German, Austrian, Swiss, and Italian, Spain, and everything. The way that the Southern Europeans and the Northern Europeans and the British make decisions and the way the expectations are all so very, very different. And I see that there are multifaceted structural problems that are facing Europe today. It's a mindset problem, it's not just the debt crisis. So by pumping money into the system right now, I don't see it solving the mindset problem. Uh, 
the problem really is excessive debt. I mean, if any government or any country spends more than it earns, uh, and there's no sustainable way of financing the expenses, uh, it's going to hit the wall, regardless, right? So by pumping in money, it's just like a temporary transfusion. So perhaps it's better for the Eurozone to disband and let it rebuild. Thank you. Well, uh, pumping money is the, the, the short-term solution and basically the, the only solution that there was to, to keep things afloat. Uh, the, the alternative, if you stop pump, pumping money in uh, uh, tomorrow or if the ECB stops intervening or whatever, then what happens is that then countries like Spain and Italy, suddenly they, they are shut out of the, of the bond markets. They cannot borrow anymore. They'll have to run to, uh, to uh, European bailout mechanisms in, in any case. So either uh, in the short term, for, for the short term, either in the absence of a firewall, okay, and in, in, uh, in the absence of the ECB acting as the lender of last resort to stop the market, let's say, Pumping in uh, short-term money was the only way that you could keep the structure afloat. Otherwise, it breaks down. And as we said before, if it breaks down, then all the dominoes fall and the consequences are, are tremendous. Can I, sorry, when you say something. I want to say one, one thing, maybe just to, to give an explanation. What was the strategy? I think the strategy, and well, I understand the critic, uh, the critic that we not put immediately a an, an, an strong enough firewall. Yes, you, you, you mentioned the number of two trillion. I heard this very often. But I think our strategy was always that that would not be enough, and that would just encourage to go on like we are now, and that we wanted to avoid. Uh, as well from a fiscal point of view, as well from a competitivity <coughs> point of view, and flexibility of labor markets and so on. So what we did was from the beginning on to opt for a comprehensive strategy. A comprehensive strategy that means to, to tackle, to, to, to move towards an economical union, fiscal union, uh, uh, restructuring, competitivity, uh, restructuring labor market and so on. That, I think, is still what we're trying to do. The disadvantage of this has been that uh, every time what we do, did something on the financial uh, on the financial side, this means that you have to put money in, as you're saying, that the whole system doesn't collapse, always looks like we're doing it just at the last minute when we have to do it. But uh, I think what has to be understood, and also what was the, the, the fundamental, I think, German attitude, is that you have first to make reforms. You cannot, the Germans don't want to give money without that other doing reforms, the ones who need to do reforms. Not everybody needs to do the, the, the same reforms. I think Poland, for example, is in a little bit a different situation than others. But this is, I think this has to be understood uh, why we, we went this way. And it was never uh, our way, like, like the, the, the last speaker or uh, mm. the question I asked, that we just want to put money in. You know what, I'm going to try and inject, this is a desperate attempt, to inject some optimism on this European question. And to suggest to you, Francesco, that there may possibly be one potential silver bullet that could save the situation. I mean, if it be some pain. But could you possibly sort of, in a sense, get the leaders united to tell the European people, listen, we are in deep trouble. We're not going to get out of this easily. Can we all of us agree, 600 million people of the European Union, let us, let us agree that we all sacrifice together. Each one of us sacrifices 10%, whatever it is. At the end of the day, if we all sacrifice together, Europe will be safe. Can that, was that message politically palatable? This is, this is what in theory should happen, right? That they all get together and, and decide that, uh, that, that something have, has to be done uh, altogether. But the, the problem is that, you know, you take a country like Germany. Yeah. Uh, Germany has, has paid a trillion euro, uh, uh, more or less equivalent over the years, for its, the, the price of its reunification mm. between East and West. They had to tighten their belts really, really uh, uh, mm. tight. Uh, 
in the uh, in the beginning of uh, of the, 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 the this decade, uh, the Germans tightened their belts again. Uh, uh, with labor reforms. Their wages actually in real terms went slightly down while the rest of Europe's wages went up. So at some point, I mean, Germans who are still sacrificing today, if you are German and you, and you see your business is not doing too well uh, and, and somebody comes to you and say, you still have to pay uh, to make the, the, the French retire earlier uh, than you, <laughs> five years. <laughs> or the Greeks not pay taxes and so on. So it is extremely difficult to extract even more concessions, let's say, from a country like, like Germany. Yeah. So you can see my optimism <laughs> failed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think you will all agree. I'm sorry, the time is up. My apologies. But I can tell you, Francesco, I have never, ever seen this room so full on a Friday afternoon at 5.15. You obviously have got some magical formula to bring in a big crowd. I hope Europe doesn't have to go down as a result. <laughs> but clearly, this is, the, this is a really, it's an amazingly important topic, and we are very fortunate that the Lee Kuan Yew School, we're very privileged to get these very distinguished speakers coming from all over the world to address us. And on behalf of the school, I want to thank you very much. And since you cannot, I could not give you European uh, uh, optimism, I'm going to give you some Asian optimism with my book, <laughs> The New Asian Hemisphere. I hope you have to balance the, some of the European pessimism that you, you're experiencing. So please join me in thanking Francesco. Thank you very much.